On this Tuesday night, recommendation reversal. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine now deemed safe and effective for Canadians over 65. We try to monitor the evidence. Plus, the latest on the evidence about blood clots and why doctors say you shouldn't worry. Dreading a third wave, what's driving up cases in some provinces? Healing the healers. Psychologists need psychologists too. The pandemic's toll on mental health professionals. And the frenzy about non-fungible tokens. Yeah, I could just do it off my phone or on my computer. The trend in digital collectibles. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with news about the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and a major change to the advice on who can get it in Canada. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization now says the AstraZeneca vaccine is safe and effective for use in people 65 years and older. It says there's enough real-world evidence to show it protects seniors from severe disease and hospitalization. That reverses an earlier recommendation made because people older than 65 had not been included in the original clinical trials. At the same time, though, more European countries have suspended use of the AstraZeneca vaccine in all age groups. Sweden and Latvia are the latest to suspend the shot after reports a small number of recipients developed blood clots. The European Medicines Agency says there is no indication the shot caused the blood clots, it is carrying out rigorous analysis of the reports and will deliver conclusions, it says, on Thursday. Currently, we are still firmly convinced that the benefits of the AstraZeneca vaccine outweigh the risk of these side effects. Reports of blood clots after the AstraZeneca shot are very rare. According to the vaccine developer, there have been 37 reports of clots among the more than 17 million people who have been vaccinated in the EU and Britain. It is important to note, too, none of the vaccine batches under investigation in Europe have been shipped to Canada. Expanding who can get the AstraZeneca vaccine here is causing the provinces to rethink their vaccine rollout. Michael Couture has our top story tonight. I think that people have to realize that it's not that we're flip-flopping, it's just that we try to monitor the evidence. The head of the National Advisory Committee on Immunization might have sounded a little defensive while trying to explain how the guidance changed in a matter of weeks. NASI never said the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine was bad for Canadians aged 65 and older. There just wasn't enough data to prove it was good. And Dr. Caroline Quash Tan used a colorful analogy to describe the enormous task of approving a vaccine. Ideally, you know, we would do one recommendation with all the data in hand, but that's impossible. So that's why, you know, you start with one thing and you start chewing that elephant slide, slice by slice. Okay, this is a real one right here. <laughs> that explanation was tough to digest for Ontario Premier Doug Ford. He's promising people already booked for the shot through the province's pharmacies and primary care settings that they won't lose their spot. But he says the new guidelines throw a wrench into the province's immunization plans. They're changing and moving the goalpost. I, I can't begin to tell you how the logistics behind it. Um, it just messes everything up, to be very frank with you. Ontario and Nova Scotia are now both reviewing the new NACI recommendations. I'm a little upset with NACI as well. This epidemiologist says the committee should have seen the real-world data on the vaccine sooner. Quebec did that and already started using the vaccine in that age group. But there is concern the mixed messages around the shot erodes faith in the process. Unfortunately, we can't wait two years until all the answers are in before saying this is our best estimate of how these vaccines work and where it should work. You got to do it now uh, to, save, to save civilization. And that's only possible with proper communication and some education, which lead to buy-in from the population. Michael Couture, Global News, Ottawa. There is a lot to digest about vaccines and information changes as more people get them. Based on the evidence from Europe now, public health doctors like BC's Dr. Henry say there is not cause for concern. We have to remember as well that over 17 million doses of AstraZeneca have been given. And so far, 37 cases of these uh, blood clots in different ways have been det detected. This is lower than we might see even in the general population without vaccination. 
There is lots to take in about this. To add more clarity, Dr. Suman Chakrabarty, an infectious diseases physician, joins me. Doctor, people sometimes get blood clots. I had deep vein thrombosis, for example. It had nothing to do with any vaccine. Based on the evidence so far, should Canadians be worried about the AstraZeneca vaccine? Well, based on what we know so far in our trials and also what's seen in real world experience in the UK, there's no signal that there's any increased risk of clots. And it's important to watch for this, uh, you know, in, in the post marketing analysis. But right now, there's no evidence for this. So I think that right, we have this vaccine that's quite safe and effective. And I urge Canadians to get it. We are still in the midst of a pandemic. Half the new cases in Ontario, for example, are now the more transmissible variants of concern. Can we afford to hesitate about getting vaccinated? It's a good point. And, you know, people have a lot of questions. I think it's important to answer them and alleviate fears. But, yes, vaccination is our ticket out of the pandemic. And it's important to try to get as much widespread vaccination as possible. I want people to be able to make an informed decision. And that's what our job is right now, to help with that. But overall, we have now four choices that are very, very good and safe. And I would urge Canadians to get whichever one is offered to you. And we can get out of this uh, this uh, outbreak as soon as possible. The risk analysis, risk benefit analysis, what are the risks of not getting vaccinated right now, especially for people over the age of 65? Yeah, we do know that as the older you are, the higher risk you are of getting severe disease of COVID, hospitalization, and of course, death. And, you know, the thing about COVID, it's something that can, uh, uh, you know, affect you in a way that you might not even expect. So I think it's important that with vaccination, we prevent all that. We prevent death, we prevent morbidity. And that's, I think, the biggest thing we want for all of our population, protect everyone, and really kind of get uh, the key to exiting the pandemic and uh, making this all a memory behind us. That would be nice. Dr. Chakrabarty, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Take care. The provinces are progressing in administering vaccines, though it is still slow going. Across the country today, more than 104,000 doses were given. More than 2.6 million people in Canada have now received at least one dose. That works out to roughly 7% of the population. Ontario science advisors are warning a third wave has taken hold in that province, driven by the more contagious variants of concern. And there are troubling signs the variants are spreading fast across parts of Western Canada, too. Heather Urex West looks at where this is leading and what needs to be done now to slow it down. drive through immunization clinics in Regina, Saskatchewan are up and running, but it will take more than vaccine to get this city out of a very troubling spot. My concerns are many, actually grave, in fact. Of the nearly 500 active cases in Regina right now, nearly half are either confirmed or presumptive cases of new variants. We had to look at uh, a sharp, uh, immediate and a short lockdown, you know, of of uh, of a circuit breaker type, uh, you know, uh, to keep the you know to keep these variants from really getting away from us. If we would just let our guards down completely, then we're really talking again about thousands of cases per day, and it could be considerably worse than what we've seen during the second wave. We need to be aware of that. The virus is spreading most quickly in Ontario, where variants of concern now account for half of all new cases and are driving new growth. But in the West, the situation is escalating too. Both BC and Alberta have seen case numbers rise since mid-February, while Manitoba has seen its test positivity number grow day over day since the beginning of March. Though so far, officials in both Alberta and BC don't believe numbers are increasing quickly enough to warrant serious concern. Right now, we are still in a very small percentage of our cases that are variants of, con of concern. But that's simply not the case right now in Ontario. It's really hard to know exactly how this is going to play out, but it's pretty clear there's been a rise in cases over the last week, and that's more than a blip. That's a real deal. And with vaccine campaigns months away from hitting that critical mass needed to control the virus, tighter health restrictions may once again need to come into play. A tough reminder that while we are close to the end, the COVID-19 pandemic is just not over yet. Heather Yorks West, Global News, Calgary. Moderna has begun testing its vaccine in children between the ages of 6 months and 12 years. The company intends to enroll about 6,700 children in Canada and the U.S. in the study. It will assess the safety and efficacy of two doses given 28 days apart and will include a year of follow-up. 
In December, Moderna began testing its vaccine in 12 to 18-year-olds. Moderna is approved for use in Canada for people 18 and older. Experts don't expect it will be approved for use in children for some time. The past year has taken a toll on the mental health of many Canadians, whether they realize it or not. And the people we turn to, psychologists, counselors and therapists, are also bearing a heavy load, guiding people through these troubled times. Ross Lord looks at how the people caring for our mental health are coping with their own. Ever since the pandemic started, nurses and other health care workers have been rightly singled out for their courage and endurance. But another group on the front lines has been largely ignored mental health professionals. So I would say there's a five-fold increase in people seeking help, and people are entirely correct to be seeking help in these circumstances. Dr. Simon Sherry says turning away people who need help in Nova Scotia's underfunded mental health system has left him stressed out. You're helping people with the problem while also suffering the ill effects of the problem at the same time. A predicament they don't normally discuss publicly. Some pandemic adjustments they've made with clients are easier to share than others, like switching to virtual sessions. They go to their car and go out into the middle of an empty parking lot because that's the only place they can get privacy. Or um, people who have large families, young kids, um, I've had sessions take place within uh, sheds, walk-in closets. Um, The downside for everyone is inescapable. In a survey posted by Statistics Canada in February, 70% of healthcare workers reported their mental health was either somewhat worse now or much worse now than before the pandemic. When asked how stressful most days are for them now, more than half replied quite a bit stressful or extremely stressful. Like other studies of its kind, it did not include mental health professionals who are also struggling with compassion fatigue and the threat of burnout. You can't provide support and care to others unless you're in a centered space and able to provide that to yourself. Psychologists need psychologists too. Sherry says in addition to monthly peer support meetings and mountain biking, he turns to his family for support. So one of my key coping tools was to go home and walk around the living room with my baby every night. It was good to hold that little guy and to feel close and comfortable with him. Coping while hoping the pandemic ends soon. Ross Lord, Global News, Halifax. A senior military officer and veteran of the war in Afghanistan is leaving the Canadian Armed Forces because of what she calls the failure of its leaders to deal with sexual misconduct. In a letter to her commanding officers, Lieutenant Colonel Eleanor Taylor requested her release from the military as soon as possible. She says she is sickened by ongoing investigations of sexual misconduct among our key leaders. She adds she is not surprised by what's happening and says she is certain the scope of the problem has yet to be exposed. In Alberta, a 19-year-old has been charged with murder after the stabbing of a fellow student at a high school yesterday morning. The student who died is 17-year-old Jennifer Winkler. Police say she was stabbed multiple times in a classroom at Christ the King Catholic High School in Leduc. She was airlifted to a hospital in Edmonton where she later died. Hours later, the suspect, a student at the same school, was arrested. Dylan Thomas Pountney is charged with first-degree murder. Investigators say the two knew each other, but haven't specified how. When it happened, the school was put into lockdown and students are struggling to understand what happened. Classes have been cancelled and trauma and grief counsellors have been brought in to help them cope. A Canadian actor makes history coming up. What Elliot Page just did as he reflects on his life's journey. Plus, an update on Prince Philip. Halifax-born actor Elliot Page has made history as the first openly transgender man to be featured on the cover of Time magazine. It is his first interview since he went public in December with his gender identity and transition. The 34-year-old describes it as a feeling of true excitement and deep gratitude to have made it to this point in my life, but that it's also mixed with a lot of fear and anxiety. He says past awards shows and red carpet appearances were especially challenging, telling Time magazine, I just never recognized myself. For a long time, I could not even look at a photo of myself. 
He says, my privilege has allowed me to have resources to get through and to be where I am today. I want to use that privilege and platform to help in the ways I can. Prince Charles says he's thrilled his father, Prince Philip, is back home after a month in hospital. The Duke of Edinburgh, who turns 100 in June, was admitted for an infection and then transferred to a second hospital for a heart procedure. Prince Philip is now back home at Windsor Castle with his wife, the Queen, and is said to be in good spirits. Families facing fewer options for help ahead battling rare diseases during the pandemic. Everyone has been affected in some way by the pandemic. People who are being treated for rare, sometimes fatal diseases have suffered more hardship than most, including children. Tonight, Karen Lieberman has some of their stories. Ah, good job. Three-year-old Joseph Gortnar pushes his big sister on the backyard swings. It's bittersweet because he's taking like a big brother role, even though he's the little brother. Five-year-old Claire is one of around 15 children in Canada fighting a rare, deadly disease. Batten disease CLN2 is a uh, regressive neurological disorder that is almost like a combination of many other diseases. Uh, they slowly lose the ability to walk. They slowly lose the ability to talk. They'll get dementia. Claire is not alone in her battle. It may not look like it, but Joseph has the disease too. For the Gortnars, the COVID-19 pandemic has not impacted the children's regular enzyme replacement therapy, but they are feeling the effects of the virus in other ways. How do you do PT virtual? How do you do OT virtual? Um, you can't. The Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders is pushing Ottawa to move ahead with a rare disease strategy promised in the 2019 budget. $1 billion for two years beginning in 2022, with dedicated annual funding to follow. Last March, when we finally got to the government to say, OK, we can begin consultations, almost a week later is when COVID happened. One in 12 Canadians is living with a rare disease. That's nearly 3 million people. Most are children. Put a book. Like Michael Pirovalakis, who has an ultra-rare neurodegenerative disease called spastic paraplegia 50. Michael is one of 61 in the world and the only one in Canada. There is no cure, but there is hope that gene therapy will be able to halt and potentially reverse the effects of the disease. For us to manufacture and to get it to the FDA and through the regulatory process, it takes a lot of time, a lot of money. Time is not on Michael's side. SPG 50 will begin to rob him of all of his functions, and the pandemic has severely slowed the ability to fundraise. We had to cancel our golf tournament, we had to cancel our gala. What hasn't changed for these families over the last year is the need to take precautions, to live in their own bubble. And as Canadians line up for a COVID vaccine, they pray for a cure. Karen Lieberman, Global News, Toronto. Let's get digital next, decoding NFTs, the virtual craze with some really big price tags. Okay, this next story requires you to pay attention because it is the next big thing and it's a bit hard to grasp. It's about non-fungible tokens or NFTs. NFT. <laughs> This techno song is an example. Elon Musk produced it. It's about NFTs and it's being sold as an NFT. He's already had bids of over a million dollars, apparently. Non-fungible tokens are digital tokens that enable true ownership of any kind of digital asset. So a song, artwork, or a moment in sports. You can't touch it, but you can own it. Told you you had to pay attention. Our senior business correspondent, Anne Gaviola, has more details. This digital collage created by an artist who goes by the name Beeple sold last week for $70 million. It was sold as an NFT. And on Saturday, the NFT of the internet meme Grumpy Cat sold for more than 83,000 US. So what exactly is an NFT? It stands for non-fungible token. Fungible is something that can be swapped for something of equal value. Something that's non-fungible is unique, not easily exchangeable for something of that exact value. NFTs only exist 
online, they come with proof of ownership stamped into a blockchain, a digital ledger that's like a receipt issued by the content creator proving that you own the rights to that video clip, artwork, article, or even a tweet. Most of these digital rights contracts live on the Ethereum blockchain and must be purchased in its cryptocurrency Ether, the world's second biggest cryptocurrency next to Bitcoin. NFTs have been around for years, but interest in them has picked up. In 2020, they became a market worth a quarter million dollars. One of the latest NFT crazes is NBA Top Shots, digital videos and art, the modern day equivalent of trading cards. So a moment that I would love to collect is like the Kawhi Leonard Game 7 shot. As Raptors fans, we all remember that Game 7 shot. It's been stitched into our brains. Sheetal Jaitley spent about $500 on NBA Top Shots. He says they're now worth more than $5,000. Yeah, I feel like a kid again. I don't necessarily have to go to the store and buy all these baseball cards and hockey cards like I did when I was a child. It's great to see I could just do it off my phone or on my computer. Alex Tapscott wrote about NFTs in his book Blockchain Revolution. He says there's irrational exuberance at play, but that doesn't mean the technology isn't here to stay. We're talking about art, which is something that you know appeals to people on an emotional level. Maybe they see it as an investment, something that they'll be able to resell at a price later on. Financial experts say stimulus money, pandemic savings, and extra time spent online have all fed into the NFT surge, but this extra bandwidth for digital assets may also be limited. A good general rule of thumb is not to put your money into anything that you don't understand. So if NFTs have piqued your interest, make sure you do your homework and understand the risk inherent in investing in something whose value is determined by an online community, whose interest and attention could shift. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Well, that's good advice. And that is Global National for this Tuesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is beautiful Lake Louise, Alberta. Thanks for watching. Robin Gill will be at the anchor desk for the next couple of days. I'll be back Saturday for the new reality. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.